And if I did that, then we're all in this together. We're all just trying to be the best selves we can be and all of that. At the same time, um, take an argument like this. Uh, why, uh, why can't we get along? We all want the same thing. I, I occasionally hear that. I'm in Berkeley again, remember. I'm in Berkeley. <laughs> Okay, can you see what's wrong with that problem, with that argument? Yeah, we don't yeah. all want the same things. No, no it's, 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 that's true too. And that's but try this out. We all want we all want happiness. We all want food. We want. Why don't we all? Why can't we all get along? Why can't we cooperate? Because we want the same things. Hmm. It's like if it's like if if there was a rival. Let's say I was uh, I was trying to win the exclusive um, matrimonial heart of some woman, hmm. and some other guy was too, and he says. Why can't we get along? You and I both want the same thing. We both want to get monogamously married to this person. You see the problem there. There is going to be competition. And there has been competition since the origins of life. So I'm not saying, um, and because there's limited resources, there's limited time. And so, so the, the relationship, when to compete and when to cooperate is really interesting. So to tie it to the a-hole thing, um, I'm assuming already that everybody's selfish to some degree or another. Everybody's competitive to some degree or other. Everyone is hypocritical to some degree or another. Everyone lies to some degree or another. We call it different things. We call it being diplomatic or being tactful or not sharing something that would hurt someone, but we, we all have to do that. So that raises a really big question. If everybody does all the things, what makes someone an egotist, a liar, a hypocrite, um, you know, these are really interesting questions that we often don't get to. That's what, part of what this new book is about, you know. Everybody engages in behavior that certainly someone is going to think of it as uh, the behavior of an a-hole. Hey, well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to All the Things with Lane and Laney. Our next guest is a doctor of philosophy and has authored two books entitled Neither Ghost Nor Machine, The Emergence and Nature of Selves, and What's Up with the A-Holes, <laughs> Advanced Psycho Psychoproctology for Beginners. I want to make sure I got that right. Uh, if you didn't get the pun, please keep listening for further enlightenment. Uh, he has also penned over a thousand articles that have been uh, read by over 9 million readers for the website magazine uh, Psychology Today. His cradle to grave research goes from our origins with life function to the assholes that we've become. Ooh. He calls the human condition ironic. We will explore that. Uh, he has a lot of very good questions already prepared that will make you think. Uh, from which I'm going to steal and use. Uh, so let's just see where this goes. Uh, please welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jeremy Sherman. Hello, it's nice to be here. Hello. Very nice to be here. Yeah. So in our correspondence prior to this interview, uh, you people tell you that you're a great guest for the show like ours. So I'm getting the impression that you live for these kind of discussions. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, I, my idea of a good time is sitting on the front porch of the universe, uh, speculating about it and us in it. Awesome. So I, that's, that's just what that's that turned out to be what um, what I like to do with my life. I also think, um, in a way, so we are some of the few things in the entire universe that can actually actually speculate about the whole ball of wax. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, we have a lot to do to keep um, being able to speculate about the universe. That is, we have to survive. Right. Um, we have to keep on being, um, which takes work. We have to hustle. One of my favorite examples of that is um, that every 24 hours, you regenerate 240 billion cells um, to replace the 240 billion that you've lost, more or less. I mean, give or take a cell. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're hustling all the time, but but humans, because we have language, are some of the few things that can speculate about the whole ball of wax. Cats can't to the same extent. Dogs can't to the same extent. We can. Um, you could say that's the reward we pay for the, the grueling punishment of being the anxious species we are. We also can worry about a whole lot more than, than a cat can worry about. 
Um, and I would argue that's a function of us having language. Uh, language enable, it, it, language gives us the, uh, the detailed imaginations we have. So, so three things right out. You, you got to hustle to stay alive. You got to run to stay in place. Um, we're all doing that. All organisms are doing that. Um, we are extremely anxious bunnies uh, compared to other organisms. If you just think about what you could worry about at night compared to a dog, it's just <laughs> overwhelming. Right. Um, and on top of that, uh, the, the, the icing on the frosting is that we can speculate about the whole universe. So yes, this is my idea of a good time. Okay. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I say, I want to touch on your, uh, your idea of the, uh, you know, the speculation is it because these animals are just, their brains are so small they do not have the capacity for intelligence. No, no it, 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 we we um, that would be a simple. It's a simple and popular argument. But whales have bigger brains than we do, and chihuahuas have bigger ba uh, brains relative to their body size oh. than we do. It's actually a difference in how our brains work. Um, uh, that's uh, more detailed than that. And also the question of intelligence. Intelligence is a very strange word. Animals are extremely intelligent at doing certain things. They're better than us at doing certain things. Yeah. Plants are better than us at doing <laughs> certain things. I mean, uh, but, um, but we have a particular kind of intelligence. And um, when we talk about intelligent life forms elsewhere in the universe, we're usually talking, uh, we mostly mean ones that could use language the way we do. Okay. So language is a very different system, what we call semiotic system. Mm -hmm. That is, there, there's basically three kinds of sign systems, ways that organisms can interpret their reality. And, uh, and language is, is just one of them. And we're the only ones who've got it in spades. I mean, they've got a, there are a few, uh, there are a few chimpanzees that they've been able to teach 250 words, but we've got 20,000, 30,000, and we mix and match them in a way that no other animal can achieve. And so we can imagine all sorts of things. I mean, it would take, for example, you could imagine a rhinoceros spinning the universe on its candy cone horn at the, you know, <laughs> it, while wearing a tutu and singing... <laughs> The Star Spangled Banner. No animal could do that. That's a function of us having this radically uh, uh, elaborate, complex system of grammar and, and vocabulary. And so it makes us a radically different organism. A big chunk of my work is just trying to understand what it's like to adapt to reality under the drunken influence of language. Language gives us, we live in two worlds. We live in the world, the real world, like all organisms, and we live in the world of our imaginations, mm -hmm. um, which makes us way more visionary than any other creature and way more delusional. Because we <laughs> sure. can, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah. yeah, so that's, that's, that's the difference. But yeah, yeah. So, in, so notice I use intelligence in two different ways. Animals have intelligence, yeah. but if we're talking about intelligent life forms elsewhere in the universe, we probably mean one that can communicate in some kind of language. Okay. So how about the idea of training an animal, whether it be a chimpanzee or even a dog? I mean, if you walk up to a dog and you know that dog and that dog knows you, it's reading your body language. Oh, totally. Yeah. But no, no, no. All organisms, even the, the simplest bacteria have, they, they have to be able to interpret reality, which means they're interpreting things in their reality as signs that they need to respond to. But they're not doing it, they don't have to do it consciously or with feeling. And yeah, so there's a whole field where I'm very active. I just wrote an academic article for it called biosemiotics. So semiotics is basically how interpretation happens. And biosemiotics is explaining from its very origins, at the origins of life, how interpretation happens. A body has to, a, a being has to interpret DNA. You know, we talk, it, it's, yeah. it's DNA is a chemical. Yeah. So how a chemical ever becomes a sign for an organism is a whole complicated question. So back to the dog. Yes, of course it's responding. And dogs are a good case because uh, they respond, we would call it iconically and indexically. But the, but the point is, think about Pavlov's dog. It gets to where it hears a sound and interprets it <clears throat> as food coming its way. Yeah. So that would be called an indexical sign, basically like an index finger, bell points to food. 
for the dog. It's always an interpretation for a dog for its own benefit. So it's paying it. It's trying to, it's trying to pick up the cues and yeah, you can train a dog to, to do all sorts of things, but you can't train a dog so far um, to understand rhinoceros is spinning universes on the, on their candy corn ho- horn. That's, right. Yeah. And, and, and there'd be some relief in it <laughs> to not be, a, not be able to do that stuff. Cause yeah, I mean, that's a charming image with the tutu and all that, but, but uh, no, you can, you, people can conjure up all sorts of terrifying, imaginary, unreal oh, sure. things oh, yeah. that distract them from reality. I mean, other organisms are just dealing with reality. That's all they've got to deal with. Yeah. And, <laughs> And nice we can deal with them. all sorts of unreal <laughs> things and take them so seriously that we neglect reality. Dangerous. <laughs> yeah. As I say, so are we just, are we just trained animals? I mean, our reality that we interpret, we are learning from it, trained by it. Technically, when I walk out, I see a stop sign, I stop. If I yeah. walk out and the wind is blowing, I need a coat. So we're all just programmed? Is that what you're... Well, no, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. First okay. of all, so the word train, train can imply a trainer. And the rain isn't trying to train us on anything. The rain is... So um, not all the signs we pick up are communicated by other things. But we have to interpret them anyway. And anything in the universe is a potential sign. It's only a real... It's only a sign when some agent, some entity, some self, interprets it as about something for their purposes. Mm. And, 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 but, but you get to something with the stop sign, you get to something that I have to say often, because scientists are all over the map on these questions. I say a stop sign doesn't cause you to stop unless you crash into it. <laughs> we stop at it because we interpret it right. as about that? something for us a uh, stop sign does not mean uh, the same thing to every culture. So yes, and to, to, to your point about that, yeah, in a way our society trains us, you could say, um, on on how to interpret signs. Um, but it, but you're you're getting at something that's really fundamental to this work and is overlooked by a whole lot of scientists. There's a radical difference between cause and effect and interpretation. For example, I could interpret, I, there's a stop sign at the end of my road right here. If I, if I went by there and the stop sign wasn't there someday, I could interpret that as about a bunch of different things. So the, the, the city has lost its, uh, its way. Some vandal has come in the night. It could mean lots of different things. It's open to interpretation. Mm-hmm. But notice also in cause and effect, a phys- there has to be a physical material cause of every effect. Sure. But that's not true with interpretation. If you don't hear from a friend, that's the absence of something, and it causes an interpretation. Interpretation is really different. So so though this origins of life work that I've been part of for a quarter of a century is dealing with this question, which is how does interpretation start from chemistry? Chemicals are not interpreting each other. You know, and and physics isn't interpreting it itself. A physics professor can say, the moon pulls on the tides because it interprets it as good for the moon or good for the tides. That, you can't do that. Down the hall, you have to do that. In biology, we're talking about interpretation all the time. Right. This organism, this dog interprets the bell as about this so that it can get some food because it needs food, because it wants food. All of that stuff shows up in the life and social sciences and has no place in physical science. You can't talk about interpretation. I mean, at the quantum levels, a few people talk about interpretation as essential to uh what's going on at the physical level but n- n- no it's there's no interpretation until there's organisms trying to do things okay yeah well, let's, uh, we'll take it back to the beginning yeah 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 sounds good um, so um yeah we, we, we went down a deep rabbit hole yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. we would start with <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> a problem. <laughs> not a problem you raised a couple of questions and I, and yeah. I said, See, yeah. it's just what i said i would do I go yeah. on that's on. good that's good we like that <laughs> okay so with your uh, your research that you've done, can you explain the origins of life struggle for existence via chemistry and you know what it tells yeah. us about psychology? Yeah, so psychology would come way later. So we're talking about, I'm talking about before DNA, because DNA, in, interpreting DNA is actually a pretty fussy business. You need a fairly elaborate chemical system for 
an organism to be able to interpret it. Now we have a model for how you'd get there, but here's here I want to just frame up the question first, and then I'll give you a a, a first pass uh, at it. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's the thing: we nothing we do violates the laws of physics and chemistry. There's no there's nothing we do that 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 sidesteps them. Everything we do can be explained physically and chemically. And nothing was added to us. If you're working in science, you can't assume some magical unknown force that enters into us and makes us come alive. That I mean, yeah, you, you, uh, I could explain why that doesn't happen in science, but the, the, basic, the basic reason why you don't do that in science is that if you can do that about one thing, you can say, well, this magical thing entered into matter and made it come alive. What can't you explain that way? I could say lightning is just because some lightning spirit came into the matter and made it come into become lightning. Right. So I think of science as an, a campaign to find natural explanations for all natural phenomena. So we assume no, no um, supernatural forces. So the reason, so notice what I've got so far. I've just, I've just said two things won't work um, to explain what we are. Neither we're not a ghost, not some magical supernatural thing that got dropped into us, nor are we just that chemistry, because we do things that chemistry doesn't do. We try, we struggle for our own existence, and chemistry doesn't. Chemistry just does chemistry is passive, it, it's bumped around, it moves around this way or not. It's not proactive, it's not trying to do anything in the universe. So this raises a huge question because I'm basically saying selves and trying are something different from nothing but chemistry. And the question is, what is that difference? Right. What is that yeah. difference? And no smoke and mirrors. I can't, I can't hand wave my way out of this one. I'm not a machine. Machines aren't trying any more than rocks are trying. They're not trying to do anything. They're just doing. They're just doing. They're just doing. And, they, and we use them for our trying, but they aren't trying at all. Um, if they were, you'd, you'd feel more uh, sorry about putting them out of their uh, out of their misery, you know, <laughs> killing them. It would, you know, it, 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 right. we just don't do that. We turn them off at night and we're not worried about it at all. Um, uh, so, so trying is something different from nothing but chemistry. The question is what? And a lot of people speculated about it at a high level. They maybe start with humans or they start with emotional organisms. We say in this research team I'm part of that's been led by a guy who I met when I was getting my PhD, I, I was in a program that let me uh, get professors from everywhere. And I nabbed this Harvard, uh, Harvard neuroscientist um, who was just beginning to deal with these questions. So he had spent his first 20 years doing neuroscience research on the evolution of language and how it changes oh, wow. us. All right. And it had turned into this uh, book uh, called The Symbolic Species. And I had read it before I met him and I cried when I read it, not because it was moving, it was far from moving. I cried because it was over my head. I mean, it's just really oh. hard. <laughs> I just felt thoroughly punked by this book. And then I happened to meet him shortly after that. And he turned out to be, um, at Harvard, they called him a genius and a saint because he'll talk to anybody who's interested in the questions. He's just, he's into, he's into these porch conversations like I am, just sitting on the porch and speculating about uh, the universe and us in it. Um, he decided to be on my committee. And then shortly after that, we ended up, uh, he ended up moving to UC Berkeley, my town. So we've been jamming ever since. And you know, we take a dog walk three times a week. Uh, the dog doesn't understand for all the reasons I've explained here. <laughs> what we're doing, but the dog loves me and I love the dog. Uh, and, and we have these great conversations about this stuff. So we've been working on it a long time. So his approach to this next question. So he takes on these humongous questions that are almost not addressed in the sciences. And this big one, what is trying? Uh, what is trying? What are selves, only selves try? What are selves and trying? And he decides that the way to go at it is to start at the very beginning, the simplest possible case of a self and the simplest possible case of trying. So what is the simplest case of trying? Well, Darwin referred to it as the struggle for existence. Yeah. Um, that's what, um, but Darwin admitted that he, did, he couldn't explain it he assumes the struggle for existence and then explains how the struggle for existence gets tailored to different environments mm. by a means of trial and error, okay? And, and so, um, so we have to explain the struggle for existence from its very origins. 
And here's the thing to notice about the universe. If the most fundamental thing, the thing that all scientists agree about is that things fall apart. Yeah. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's that entropy increases. Um, that if there's any uh, segregation where, let's say you've got cream over here and coffee over here, if you put them together and they give them a chance to interact, they'll become a coffee milk blend. Why? Because the segregation has desegregated. Everything desegregates. But that also means that things fall apart. Um, some things fall apart really slowly, like rocks or, or, or pieces of metal and stuff like that. They're durable. Mm -hmm. We are not durable at all. And if you look at what goes on with organisms, when they die, they degenerate really fast. Okay. So we have to hustle. The first work we have to explain from its origins in chemistry is the... Um, is the ability to regenerate yourself faster than you would otherwise degenerate. Yeah. Yeah. So that example I gave of the 240 billion cells uh, that you would produce even on your slouchiest day, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's an example of what all organisms are doing. And then they're doing, they're doing that even long before without feeling it or thinking about it. It's going, that kind of what we could call vegetative sentience is going on in us, just like it's going on in those trees outside um, you know, the trees can't feel it. The trees aren't conscious of it. Well, I, I can't feel my cell regeneration and I'm not conscious of it, except in this kind of, I, I can talk about it, but I don't actually, I don't have to think about it to do it. Yeah. Okay. So, so back to your question. <laughs> I swear there's an answer in here. I'm, You're I'm, fine. I'm, You're I'm not fine. just stalling. I, I, <laughs> this is all good stuff. Keep it up. <laughs> but, okay. The difference turns out to be, we would argue, not that we take in a different kind of energy. We take in energy like, uh, like a fire takes in energy. Um, it's how we channel or constrain what the energy does. How that, so energy, you know, think of it as just like a, a fire hydrant that's been busted open. It can, it, it's spewing in every which direction. Um, but if you ran it through a hose, you're channeling it um, so that it's in, in some places rather than others. Well, we know how channeling happens. You know, in electronics, it happens when you run wire through insulation and all that, or water through a pipe. That's, you know, that's a kind of constraint or that limits where the energy is doing its work, where the work is going. Um, and engineers are primarily constraint wranglers. They, they, they wire up constraints so that the energy does the work that you want it to do. Okay, well, no one engineered us. And none of those, th so here's the thing that's different about us. We channel energy into work to regenerate our ability to channel energy. That's what we do. We're, a, we're, we're circular that way. A computer does all sorts of things that we find useful, but a computer isn't busy regenerating itself. Right. Mm -hmm. A computer isn't actually regenerating the wiring as the wiring falls apart. Um, none of that. We have to do that outside to a machine. But organisms from, their, from the get-go, from the start, have to be able to channel energy into work to regenerate their ability to channel energy. And this is not very different from what we're all doing in our everyday life. So just take this as an example. Um, you've got your to-do list for today, but it's actually largely a function of your to-don't list, all the things you're not going to do today. So when, you when we talk about self-discipline or self-control or deliberation, that is, un you unliberate yourself, what we're talking about is preventing yourself from dithering, hmm. preventing yourself from spewing your energy every which way. Okay. So why do you do that stuff? You do it so that you can keep a roof over your head, so that's mm -hmm. to protect, protect yourself from degenerating, to, to buy clothes, to buy food that you can use to regenerate. Why? So that tomorrow you can, again, constrain <laughs> energy into work to regenerate yourself. And you do that as long as you can. And what disappears when we die is our ability to regenerate our own constraints. Mm. Okay. And so, so technically, a, a dead body is capable, the dead body's material is capable of doing more things, yeah. not less things. Life is not something added to physics and chemistry. It's a reduction on the possibilities. 
of what ke- ke- physics and chemistry can do. We limit it during our lives. And then when we die, that limit is gone. We're gone. But the matter is free to be moved any which way. Right. Huh. It just goes back yeah. to the earth, more or less. Yeah, so back like- to the earth. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and tossed this way and that. It's back to, it's it's available for spewing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So on the uh, on the event of of death or building up to the event of death, if we regenerate ourselves, they say a human being is brand new every ten years. Is that about right? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, like, so it, yes, yeah, not quite as simple as that because some stuff sticks around a whole long while. Teeth, for example, might might be among the more durable parts of our body, but on the other hand, we have all this um, all those cells. The 240. I mean, I've, I, I, I don't mean to multitask, but while we've been talking, I, I've been building some new cells. No. <laughs> you, seem, you seem just a slight bit distracted. I wanted... <laughs> try, 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 slightly distracted. <laughs> so if, you know, like I said, if we, if, if we regenerate 250 or 240 billion cells. Yeah. Uh, so yes, the, the, what you're pointing about the 10 year cycle assume that that's true we're not okay. built of stuff we're built through stuff sure. stuff is passing through us all the time yeah and we're trying to go out and get more things to keep everything the way it is and or grow and or maintain yes so yes. why why is it since you're so keen on this yeah uh, molecular okay. level why is it that we die why can't the body just keep regenerating and regenerating, and regenerating? Ow. Ah, um because of the second law that is, it's we are, we we can overlook this in a comfortable civilization, that the default is death, things degenerate. Mm-hmm. Um, my life is so cushy that I can assume that the default is being alive. No, it's not. I I mean, I got all these habits that are all well adapted to my reality, um, and it's not just training. You could say it's also that it's been a whole lot of trial and error learning. Yeah. 3.4 billion years of general uh, with no interruptions no accidents that eliminated your lineage yeah impressive true. by the way true um, yes congratulations uh, <laughs> but, but uh but the default remains the second law of thermodynamics things fall apart mm. and so what we have to pass on to our kids is a capacity to self-regenerate. And what's involved in self-regeneration? Well, if you take the second law as fundamental, that everything's gonna fall apart, um, you gotta do two things. You gotta protect yourself from falling apart. That's that roof over your head and the clothes you're wearing and all that sort of stuff that you hustle to keep getting. And you have to regenerate whatever degenerates. It's as simple as that. All organisms have to do that. If everything's falling apart, then what you wanna do is protect yourself from falling apart skin is also useful this way, um, uh, and regenerate whatever degenerates, including your skin. So those are the fundamental requirements for life. And since we can't do that forever, um, also fundamental is to produce offspring who can do that, who can do the combination of self-protection and self-repair. I'm also arguing here that healing, self-repair, is more fundamental than self-reproduction. You can't make kids if you're degenerated. You have to be doing that 240 billion cells a day thing in order, you know, to get lucky and have a kid. You know? <laughs> Absolutely true. Um, so so I, I don't know. Did that answer that question? I'm trying to remember what it uh, did. I was I was good, thinking good. of one as you were talking, but I'm not the type to just completely ignore you. So I kind of lost. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. You, you can ignore me to build your 240 billion cells, yeah, right. but, but don't ignore me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump around a little bit here. You... Please, anywhere. By the way, there is a direct connection to what we were just talking about. Okay. And the a hole. Thing. Oh, I know, I know. We're we're. I'm, so I'm excited those, about. That. They're actually they're actually linked up. Those two are linked up in a fabulous way. <laughs> I say I'm I'm trying to build into the a hole scenario. No, that's good. That's fine. So. Good. Take your um, time. So we'll you come back to you, it. you answer your questions or hot wild questions with cool, careful neutrality, and I think I'm going to love the answer to this. But okay. <laughs> why the cool, careful neutrality? Oh, first of all, I am in, I do not consider myself entitled to describe myself as if I know myself. 
So if if you found anywhere that I claim that oh. I answer them with neutrality, I'd be the last to know. I mean, in some <laughs> ways, I'm I'm the most inter- intimate with myself, so I should know. As at the same time, I got skin in the game. I I have a real problem with people who will tell you what they're like. You know, I <laughs> I, I mean, what I call uh, talk is walkism. You know, I'm I've got integrity. I'm a good person. I'm a no. I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do that. So what I can say is that we're trying to do that to the best extent we can. I can't even tell you how good we're doing at it, but I can say that that's my goal, is to try and answer these things neutrally. So, I mean, this is one of the interesting challenges in, in science, um, which is the more eager you are to answer a question, chances are the more eager you are for the answers to be one kind of answer instead of another kind. Mm-hmm. You know, if you do something embarrassing and you say, why did I do that? Chances are good you're hoping for a certain kind of answer <laughs> um, and not another kind of answer. So, um, uh, so this is a fundamental challenge in science. You, and we can talk about science as value neutral, but I don't think that's accurate. I think science is obsessively in the game of valuing neutrality. Okay. And it doesn't even count on individual scientists to do it because that would be not worthy you can't, and not, not trustworthy. You can't expect scientists to check their egos at the door. Instead, what you've got is scientists who are all battling against each other and they have to work from evidence. And so the way I think about it is you can't play in science without um, embracing the possibility that you will have spent your whole life barking up the wrong tree. That is, there's no guarantee that th- that our theory, which I didn't get to, I only described what the theory has to explain. So we have a chemical model for how um, constraints that channel energy into work that regenerates the constraints could ever start from simple chemistry. But I, but, but the point is, I, I, I'm not in a position to say. Time will tell whether our uh, whether a theory is a better one or a worse one or not even wrong, as some scientists say. That's a great line. Not even wrong. Keep that line. It's just, dude, you're not even wrong. So, <laughs> but um, but yes, we're after a kind of neutrality. That's what we pursue to the extent we can. Okay. Say, so do you find that the in the scientific community that it's all almost all based on ego. I feel like there could be so much more done and or collaborated on to say, yes, this is, I mean, just in the case of COVID, this is their opinion, this is their opinion, this is their opinion, this is their opinion. And it's all doctors, medical professionals, uh, scientists, and they all just seem to have a different viewpoint. Now in the scientific community, is it all people that are in the majority, is it all people that are just trying to get their research out there to try to get their, you know, their, their chest well, up? And- uh, no, I would say from my perspective, scientists are the, everybody is human, okay? okay? So we simply start from the assumption that everybody is human. And then I think science is the best guess so far at how to constrain that human tendency um, that there is. So one of the things we're seeing these days is a lot of people that say that since scientists can disagree with each other, and since sciences have scientific findings have proven wrong, this one has proven wrong and that one's proven wrong, then they must be biased or wrong, and therefore I will trust my gut mm. as the more neutral arbitrator. So this is this is what I call exempt by contempt. Since I can see the human flaws in other people, I must be an expert on seeing those flaws. And since I don't see them in myself, then I must not have them since I'm actually an expert on them. So basically I can point at other people say, look, he's got biases, as if biases are some kind of rare disease that afflict only the degenerate. (laughs) No, bias is the whole point. I wanna have good biases, not bad biases. And so, the claim that some that you've got something better than science, you have to show what it is. And I have not found anything. I work in philosophy of science, which is basically trying to understand what is science. And um, and and I got to say this: uh, even the people who who want to disregard the exploration, the search, and findings of scientists are totally reliant on science. 
Mm-hmm. As you go to, I mean, if you got cancer, you go to a doctor, unless you're way on the fringes. If you want to fly someplace, you fly on a plane that was designed by engineers who are heeding the evidence from science. We are all addicted to science. And why? Because it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what, so, so in that respect, I would say that though I would never claim that, I mean, I, I duke it out with other scientists. By the way, I don't consider myself... I consider myself a scientist by some definitions, but not by others. I don't do lab research, so I'm not that kind of uh, scientist. And yet, am I playing the game of trying to find natural explanations for all natural phenomena? Yes, so I am. But I duke it out with fellow researchers all the time, and I consider that a feature, not a bug of science. The fact that we can change our minds when we get new data, the fact that we're kicking the tires and disagreeing with each other openly the fact that we don't claim anything we believe to be the last word, no use for any, no need for further evidence. The fact that we don't engage in proud faith as if not paying attention to evidence is a virtue is why science works better than the alternatives. Does it work perfectly? Heck no. We're humans. Right. We, got, we, we are, again, we're anxious bunnies. We got a whole, no. lot, we got a whole lot riding on this. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so you got all these highly visionary, highly delusionary creatures who engaged in this game to try and figure out what the heck is going on here. Sure. And they call it speculation, but they place their best bets to be beaten by better bets when they come along. Okay. Well, I, I know you got a question, but I just yeah. got I got one yeah. more tied into this. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I'll try to keep my answer shorter. No, 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 no. no, no. Okay. Good. All right. Just do you. We'll do us. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah in relationship to that in in uh human beings in the frame of trying yes. how much of that is tied to ego oh so that's a great question so we talked a little bit about vegetative sentience this kind of running to stay in place that all organisms do on top of that we have got the whole emotional overlay all the um you could say the yucks and yums that we feel viscerally. Some, and that's a whole other system of semiotics, of, uh, that, uh, of, of, of interpretation going on. Mm-hmm. That is, we're busy interpreting our envir- environment emotionally as well as in this kind of vegetative way that I have in common with trees. So I got those two, and they're tangled with each other. You can't say that the emotions rule the, the body or the body, uh, the, 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 the vegetable part of me rules the emotional part. They're they're tangled. They're they're sometimes one dominates the other. So I can have a feeling that actually um, throws off my uh, my biochemistry. I can have biochemistry that throws off my feelings. It, they're alternating dominance. The technical term for it is that they're in a strange loop relationship. Yeah, and a weird term. But you can think of it almost like a game. In a game. Um, one side is ahead and the other side is ahead and they're alternating dominance. And it's not, it's not a, a, a routine like this. That it, it's a little uncertain who's defending, who's attacking, all of that sort of stuff. Um, they're both co-constraining each other. Now you add on top of that language and you have this whole virtual world we hang out in and it has effects on the other two as well. It's tangled up with the other two. So I got my, I got my body that's just got to keep on running. That would be running even if I was in a coma and couldn't feel anything. Sure. Okay. I got my emotions and I've got my thoughts. And now what is the ego? It is all of those things. Mm -hmm. And so remember, I'm trying to explain selves and trying. So I'm going to argue that every organism is to some extent or another self-ish. That is, it's trying to it's trying to maintain itself in a world that is not not conducive to it. That is a yeah. world in which they're trying to fall apart. Every organism is hustling on its own behalf. Now, ego has come to mean all sorts of different things, uh, but it's also come to mean the thing that th- that you should uh, leave at the door and never and never get engaged in. And if anybody doesn't like what you're doing, they'll just call it egotistical, as if that's bad and some rare thing. Like you, you are egotistical. You have a bias, like. 
It's like accusing someone of having a nose. It's like, <laughs> well, they, 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 that's right. That's what we got. That's, that's, that's part of the package here um, to be perfectly. So I, I end up, I'm in Berkeley. So I deal with Buddhists. Yeah. And they want to tell you that the ego is uh, an illusion or that the self is an illusion. Yeah. And my answer is an, an illusion to who? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Say we're all seeing it. We're all taking it in. Yeah, so I mean, if you can't say that we're nothing, we're just chemistry, right. and that the and that the ego or the self is just an illusion, because chemistry doesn't have illusions. Chemistry can't misinterpret stuff. It's not in the interpretation right. business. Right. So convince yourself you're not a self doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, yes. So is it all ego? Life is all ego. Um, what kind of ego, how to tuck in your elbows, how to jut out your elbows, all those are great questions. You know, how to be, you know, when, when people, uh, I know you can't imagine this, but people do sometimes accuse me of being arrogant. And I say, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to not be too arrogant or not arrogant enough for the situation. That is, I'm trying to figure out where to assert myself and where not to. My idea of perfect harmony and balance is when I'm equally anxious on the opposite sides of the question. Mm -hmm. You know, am I talking too much? Am I talking too little? Uh, am I too assertive? Am I not assertive enough? That's as close as I hope to get to perfection. It's just where I'm about equally anxious. because <laughs> It's all tuning. I'm just trying to tune for the situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, no, I'm not too high, too, not, not too low. So back to your question about ego, I don't know if I answered it. You might have had a different ego in, in mind, but that's my guess about it. No, I just think that the ego drives us in, in one direction that drives us to be better, but on the other aspect, it drives us to be better than that person or to be- Amen, yes. You know, that's right. That, so, turns in, that turns it back into the, the asshole phenomenon that you speak of. I mean, people just take right. that, I want to better myself. The only person that I'm trying to beat is myself. Because the only person I can beat is my best performance, but yet they try to go out and dominate other people, whether it be in conversation or physical activity or at a mental game. I think that's what I was going with. With got it, got it. So, yeah. so let me tell you, let me let me uh, respond to that by by saying um, the business about tucking in and jutting out your elbows is interesting. Um, we could, I I can make the case. Um, and can feel the case that all I got to do is beat my own best self. And, uh, you know, that, but I, that I'm not in competition with others. Um, uh, and if I did that, then we're all in this together. We're all just trying to be the best selves we can be and all of that. At the same time, um, take an argument like this. Uh, why, uh, why can't we get along? We all want the same thing. I, I occasionally hear that. I'm in Berkeley again. Remember, I'm in Berkeley. <laughs> okay, can you see what's wrong with that with that argument? Yeah, we don't yeah. all want the same things. No, no it's, it's, that's true too. And that's but important. try this out. We all want we all want happiness. We all want food. We want. Why don't we all? Why can't we all get along? Why can't we cooperate? Because we want the same things. Hmm. It's like if it's like if if there was a rival. Let's say I was uh, I was trying to win the exclusive. Um, matrimonial heart of some woman mm -hmm. and some other guy was too and he says why can't we get along you and i both want the same thing we both want to get monogamously married to this person you see the problem there there is going to be competition and there has been competition since the origins of life so i'm not saying um and because there's limited resources there's limited time and so so the the relationship when to compete and when to cooperate is really interesting so to tie it to the a-hole thing um i'm assuming already that everybody's selfish to some degree or another everybody's competitive to some degree or other everyone is hypocritical to some degree or another everyone lies to some degree or another we call it different things. We call it being diplomatic or being tactful or not sharing something that would hurt someone, but we, we all have to do that. So that raises a really big question. If everybody does all the things, what makes someone an egotist, a liar, a hypocrite? Um, you know, these are really interesting questions that we often don't get to. That's what, part of what this new book is about. You know, everybody engages in behavior that certainly someone is going to think of it as uh, the behavior of an a-hole. Yeah. yeah. What makes an a-hole? What then is an a-hole? 
Um, because if everybody does it, and I get, I get lots of this. I get lots of people who tell me, dude, no one's an a-hole. And I get people who say, dude, everybody's an a-hole. Yeah. Um, and I'm saying, no, and this is really to your question. Um, where do you draw the line on that stuff? Um, uh, and my answer actually comes out of that origins of life research. I, 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 first of all, I want to say, I think that being an, there are plenty of predators and parasites in the, in the biological world. But being an a-hole is actually a human thing. And it comes with language. And I can explain why. So, so, so we go back to this thing about um, what we've got to do. We have to hustle all day. I have to protect myself against the generation and regenerate what degenerates. That's, what, that's, my, that's job one for any living being. Okay, now here's the challenge for me doing that. To regenerate things, I need energy. But energy is exactly what degenerates things. <laughs> yeah. This is a real challenge, is that I'm taking in the stuff, what, the stuff I take in is the very stuff that erodes things. What, how do you erode pipe? You run energy through it. You, you know, it'll, corrode the, it, it'll corrode the pipe eventually to have all of that energy action going on there. That's why they make pipes very durable out of materials that are quite inert. Okay, I'm not made of those materials. I'm made of materials you can, you know, it, so, so I could use my breakfast um, to regenerate myself, but I, it, but I could also burn it and start a fire and burn down my house. So it's, this is a challenge. <laughs> So how do we deal with it? Organisms have always had to be what I'll call selectively interactive. We eat food, not poison. We drink water, not bleach. That's all organisms have to do that. Now you take that into an organism that's got a language. And what does it turn into? I'll take in the ideas that regenerate my mojo, my motivation. And I keep out the energy, the ideas that will degenerate my mojo. This is called confirmation bias. That is, I speed read hate mail, and I read three times love mail, fan mail. Yeah, okay. I don't want to hear ideas that disagree with me. I want to hear ideas that agree with me. So this is called confirmation bias. So my distinction here, where you draw the line, is that most people, decent people, decent just means adaptive. That's, that's where that word orig originated. It means well-suited. So decent or trying to be trying to trying to fit their environment. Decent people recognize confirmation bias as a problem that they need to manage. Mm. A holes treat confirmation bias as a solution to all their problems. Oh. Mm. Once you go out that far to where you become the measure of all things, um, and you just let your gut impulses decide what's true and not true about reality, and you dismiss anything that challenges you. It's really easy to do this. It's a, it's a bag of cheap tricks. It's a really simple, generic tricks that any anybody could use. You don't need to know anything to be a know-it-all. You just need to know this these simple ways of dismissing or saying, I know you are, but what am I um, at other people? And and you can, you get to play God. Um, and it's way easier than being human. And that what is that? It's just confirmation bias to the max. It's faith in your own gut. And if people let you get away with it, that's the egomania we're talking about. Are they self-obsessed people like this? I don't actually think so. I don't think narcissists are self-obsessed. Really? A, no, I think that they, they definitely appear that way. Mm -hmm. They give that feeling. I think they're working by habits that work. I think it's robotic. Mm -hmm. I think they can't afford to be looking at themselves. This, I'm not alone in this. This is what psychiatry says about them. They have very weak egos they have very weak sense of self okay yeah that is and uh, and for two reasons one way you say it is that they're 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 acting like that because they lack a sense of self so they're compensating okay. and the other version is when you start acting like that you cannot afford to be introspective you can't afford to look at yourself if you're going to be a, a, a jackass to everybody around you or to some people around you to a spouse or you know to your kids or whatever like that you can't afford, this is why people say, will you look at yourself? Will you take a look at what you're doing? The guys aren't looking. The, the people like this aren't looking. So these are, it's a kind of brain dead swell head is what they are. I just made that up. That's like, that's like <laughs> brain dead swell heads. Brain dead, that's not bad. I can use that. I like that. Because they're not, can you imagine how encumbering it would be? What a burden it would, would be to carry around a conscience 
if you're trying to lord it over everybody else it would it would your act would fail you couldn't pull it off you wouldn't be convincing you really have to become they, they say the emperor has no clothes i think the emperor is nothing but a suit of armor there's no one home there's no one home so you, they take up an enormous amount of space and there's no one home they're kind of zombie and this and by the way i want to make this clear i I, it, it, I don't think it has anything to do with what they claim to believe. An a-hole can claim that they believe this or believe that, that that's why they get to lord it over everybody else. I think it's completely irrelevant. I'm completely nonpartisan about that. I've seen a-holes. I've seen people I would diagnose, I would guess are a-holes, who claim to believe it, you know, claim that they, they are simply crusading for this or that. It doesn't matter what. You know, communism, Trumpism, Buddhism, whatever, atheism, whatever, that doesn't matter. Um, and obviously, there are also a holes who don't have a cause they claim they are acting about. They, they, will, they will tend to pretend that it is an emergency and that they are heroically rescuing the world from evil. But they do that because that's one of the ways that they can. Uh, get get their way it's just a habit i mean we don't think about this much but if you stumble on a way to say something that gets you what you want you couldn't just keep saying it you'll just keep saying it because it gets you what you want yeah. you don't ever have to think about what you're saying why would you it would only confuse things you got something that's working it's a habit so that would be so that's an interesting angle on it from my perspective is to notice that there are these brain dead swell heads hmm. It's, a, it's an interesting angle on it. But, but as for whether we all engage in the kind of behavior they do, we do, and we monitor it. My, assu my assumption is if I don't want to be an a-hole, I have to expect some anxiety. I have to wonder if, like, I woke up this morning wondering if some things I said last night uh, in social media and to a friend were appropriate or not. I even, I backed off of two of them this morning before, uh, before breakfast. I just said, I wanted to say, I want to make clear, this is just a spec, you know, a, a caveating like that. You don't get that. As people sometimes say, I'm wondering whether I'm an a-hole. If you're wondering whether you're an a-hole, chances are better that you're not one. Okay. <laughs> they don't wonder. They don't wonder about that. No, they just oh, do a show. They, they do it, either they do it and deny that they are, or they do it and they're proud that they are. So a-holes will tend to play either prude or punk. Um alternating between them so a-holes will tend to shame you for not living up to their moral standards and also laugh at you about caring about moral standards they want it both ways mm -hmm. so what what i guess what makes you an a-hole what i mean is it something me personally yeah. <laughs> not you specifically <laughs> but i mean is that is it something you learn or is it nature versus nurture is it something you can come out of is it well so so there are people who want to figure out the biological or what we would call technically etiological uh explanation for an a-hole so an a-hole is someone with a chip on their shoulder or an a-hole is someone who grew up this way or that way um i think it's i don't think that's how you can actually figure out what what's going who's an a-hole Okay. I think that any path you take, there are going to be detours to Aeolia <laughs> on that path. That is, you can slide right down into this place where you think you're on a plateau, safe and free above it all. Because I think that's really what's going on. Every organism would want self-assertion and safety. They'd want to be able to do what they want to do, unconstrained, and they'd want to not be able to fail. So what an Aeolia, what language gives us is a golden opportunity to pretend we've got that i call it the wild card trump card formula and no it's not based on donald even though he does represent this from my perspective he's just mm, pristine perfect um uh but the wild card is what i can do anything i want and the trump card is whatever i do is un uh unassailable there's not there there could be nothing that is better than whatever i feel like doing in the moment who wouldn't want that <laughs> if they could get away with it who wouldn't yeah. want absolute freedom and absolute safety that's what we'd want so i think of it as a natural temptation that you can fall into 
from any direction. And, and you know, uh, there are certain directions, there are certainly seasons. So for example, in the 1940s, uh, becoming a leftist communist in certain parts of the world was a perfect in, enticement to become a total a-hole. Uh, there are all sorts of religious enticements. After all, when you think about it, religion is perfect this, for this. I have this. I have this access to a supernatural, unknowable thing that I know about, and I am humbled before it, which means I can lord it over you, and I can say whatever he wants me to say, wh whatever he wants me to, whatever I want to do, I can say it's be. Uh, I got. I got word from God, or f from whoever. You know, some super, the higher power could do this spiritually. So there are reasons why certain paths are a little more tricky, a little slippier. They're more detours to Aeolia, both seasonally, like different eras in society, um, but also um, just because they give you wild cards. The supernatural is a wild card. Um, think about the sac any sacred text. You take the Koran, you take the Bible. They're held as if they are the one true guidance to how to live. But if you look at how they're used historically, they're a catalog of rationalizations, really yeah. open to interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. And people have interpreted them a dozen different ways. So yeah, that that's more likely to give you some detours <laughs> than if you don't do that. But you know, but you don't even need that. You know, you can simply say, uh, I've, I've had it up to here. People have been bullying me all my life from now on. It's all hell no. I'm, you know, yeah. it's my way or the highway. It, it, you know, people can get frustrated with just the challenges of their lives. And I think we're going to see a whole lot more of this as life gets a bit more challenging. Is that people are going to just simply say, no, being, being human is too hard. I'm going to play God. Okay. So a lot of my work is on how to, how to make it so you don't get away with it. I think that's a kind of, civil defense we need to cultivate. We've got neighborhood watches about crime. Um, uh, we've got government that, that handles the law. We've got psych, we've got some modest degree of mental health uh, institutions in the country to keep people from going crazy. Uh, we don't have great protection against a holery. And in fact, we have a society that tends to say, uh, be respectful, be nice, be kind, never, uh, don't be disrespectful, you know, be kind. Um, I think that's dangerous with psychopaths. To be kind to psychopaths is, is not good for you or for society. Um, I would say the same thing for a-holes. We need, we need to get better at diagnosing and responding effectively to a-holes. So how, how does that come about? How do you respond effectively? How do we make <clears throat> better decisions when we deal with an a-hole? Somebody that's just driven by their own agenda, their own their yeah. own self-interest or their group's self-interest, whatever it might be, and they come across your path and you're supposed to be respectful and kind, but they're not returning that. They're not reciprocal. Right, that's right. So first of all, I mean, I spent 200 pages in this book trying to get clear on what's going on with these people. The book is called What's Up With A-Holes. Um, but it, then once you bet, and it's just a bet, that you're dealing with an A-hole or with someone who's a holy into you. Um, that is because there, there are very full. There are some full time a holes, but a lot of them are very selective. I mean, a, an a hole is going to play it out where they can and not where they can't. There are people who can be total a holes online at night, but they're going to be respectful at their job during the day. Obviously, um, obviously, there's this huge question about what you can, uh, what's safe to do in your situation. Um, if it's a boss, you've got to be really careful. But I would say that the two basic uh, things that you have to do is to focus on the a-hole habit. Um, that's all they got. So if you expose that they are just playing these wildcard trump cards, that they'll say or do anything to feel heroic, they will respond with more of that. And you can say, that's what I'm talking about. See what he did there? He did it again. He did it again. You do not follow them around. They will want to lead you by the nose to whatever is their advantage. So if you feel that the way to deal with them is to demonstrate morality, they can just grab you by that handle and make you feel immoral for something, put you on the defensive. You do not talk content. They don't care about content. 
They don't care about the subjects they're talking about. They don't care about the things that they claim they care about so much that it overrides all other considerations. They don't care about it. You can tell from their actions. They're happy to preach it to other people. They're happy to blare their police siren at other people so loud they don't have to hear their own mistakes. Yeah. But, uh, but they don't actually care about it. So you, you turn a completely deaf ear to that and you simply say, see what he did? He will say or do anything to make himself feel heroic moment to moment. And they will only keep on answering with more of that because that's all they got. They, they're one trick phonies. But the other thing that I think is really important is to flaunt your humanness. Mm. Um, and I don't mean expose your vulnerability, but be tough about the tough judgment calls that humans are dealing with. So remember a minute ago, I said, um, uh, I, my idea of perfect harmony is when I'm equally worried about whether I'm being too arrogant or not arrogant enough. That's a human concern. So if someone accuses me of being arrogant, if an, if an a-hole accuses me of being arrogant, I'll say, yeah, that's right. I am arrogant, like all humans. I'm, I'm busy trying to figure out where to be assertive, where not to be. And it's fairly arrogant, by the way, for you to claim to be the authority on who is arrogant and who isn't. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a, that's a bold move. Um, I'm trying to figure out where to be arrogant and where not to be arrogant. You pretend that you live by this standard where arrogance is absolutely uh, unpermissible and you're the policeman who goes out and figures out who's arrogant. You don't live that way, but that's how you're posing and it's all part of your act. So yeah, you can play God if you want. I'm, I'm preferring the hard work of being human, trying to figure out when to assert myself, when not to. So those are the two main things I think you got to do. You just got to keep on hammering away that this guy, ignore their content. They'll throw things at you. They'll pretend to be moral, uh, you know, preachers when it, it, it helps them. And they'll also snicker at you like, uh, like, uh, like brats. Mm -hmm. they'll they'll play parent or they'll play child they will never meet you adult to adult <laughs> they won't they'll, they'll either lecture you on why you're immoral or they'll snigger you for caring about morality that's so a hop true. between them yeah. yeah so do you think there's a rise in a-holes lately oh yeah no we're, <laughs> definitely, what, we're, doing, what? we're def definitely dealing with an epidemic epidemic yes yeah, so do you think epidemic. i mean what do you think just the current state of affairs is what's causing it or is there something else? Well, there's a, there's a lot of, it's, uh, it's, you could say a perfect storm of yeah. things. Um, and uh, so I, in my book, you can define these words a different way, but I think of cult as the plural of a-hole. Um, uh, I work in cultic studies, the study of what's going on in cults. And that's my guess at what's going on, how you would carefully define cult. Cult is a very tricky word. We often accuse people who, uh, are united and disagree with us of being cults. Yeah. Just like we, I mean, my book whole, my whole book on a hole started with me asking the question, what is a butthead? Since it can't just be whoever we happen to butt heads with. So what is a cult if it's if it's not, you know? So um, the internet enables us to amplify and get really high on a buzz that I'm, a while ago I called exempt by contempt. It's basically holy war, which is an interesting oxymoron. Holy is, no, there's nothing purer than holiness and war is pure violence. So there's a, there's a way, there's a buzz we can get. If I'm outraged at other people, it makes me feel pure. If I'm furious with someone at li for lying to me, I will Im immediately will vaporize from my mind any recollection of ever having lied to anyone in my entire <laughs> life. I will feel absolutely pure. And as a result, I'll feel that it's my duty to be outraged at them more. So you can really rev out on this, and it gives you the, it, it gives you this this sense of purity that is so. In our complicated world, we're 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 dealing with more doubts than humans have ever dealt with, mm -hmm. and so yeah, we want relief from it. We're jonesing for relief from it, and so outrage at others is a is a very effective way of feeling purged of self doubt. So that's going to, and then to be able to do it online, it's completely safe and convenient. You can, you know, they do all sorts of things. And then the world is getting extremely complicated. So I worry most about what I'd call a dissociation death spiral. The reality gets hard. We check out. 
-hmm. and stop and deny, get more into confirmation bias, thereby re, uh, neglecting reality more, which makes it get worse, which makes us dissociate that much more. Mm -hmm. and, and that, if, if I were to guess what could make the human race go extinct, it's that. Oh, I totally what, believe it. Totally believe it. I feel like it's it's just a black hole. I feel like everyone's going down that black hole. They're all justice warriors. They're all listen to me. I'm the yeah yeah no no people. no deed too dirty for a saint like me. That's what it comes down to. It's an interesting paradox, and um and I take it personally when you said everybody's going down it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am deeply offended. <laughs> this is the end of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> No, the first, the, the words that got me working on this entire path 25 years ago, I wouldn't put it past me. That's what oh, I said. Really? Yeah. yeah, nothing human is foreign to me. I'm one of these. What do you expect? <laughs> no, <laughs> but questions of degree matter. Once again, this idea that there are no a-holes or that everyone's one, it's, that's, that's not right. No, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out degrees and, um, and uh, that is, we all engage in a-hole behavior to some extent. Even the people who don't appear to, you can be a really polite a-hole. It's, it's easy. I mean, you can, you can be highly civilized. You can you know, only whisper. You can sound earnest and be a total a-hole. So all of us are going to engage in some of it. There was a, the, the original quote, which is often misquoted, is um, power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. There are times to lie. Lying tends to corrupt, but it doesn't just corrupt. Yeah. But absolute, when, when confirmation bias becomes the solution to all of your problems in a particular situation, you are being an a-hole. It's the absolutism of it. Mm -hmm. And absolute is a great word for it because absolute actually originally meant dissolved away from. That is wholly independent of any influences. That's what absolute originally meant. So when you become an absolutist or become an absolute a-hole, what it means is that you, um, you are incorrigible in the original sense. Nothing in the world could ever correct you. That's the point. And what I'm trying to say is, boy, that'd be fun. Yeah, so that'd be, that'd be easy for everybody. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be fun. I'd like that. I'll have a basin of that, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying it's tempting to, to it, 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 it's very tempting. And, and to your point, it's, I think, increasingly tempting because of circumstances and because we can get away with it. Okay. Totally off topic, but could you raise your, uh, your giant Mason jar up so everyone knows the giant. Oh yes. No, you're it, that's a, if you're wondering what I'm on, it's this much vodka. I drink that much already. <laughs> I'm a little behind cause I've been talking, but yeah, uh, gotta catch up. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually, this is water. I just want to set the record straight here. <laughs> I hoist a class. No, it's good for my bicep and it's, and I need to keep the fluids pushing. <laughs> and it's even, it's even exercise because it means I have to keep on going back and forth to the bathroom. So there you go. Good. Get your steps in. <laughs> um, so kind of a broad question, but you've, you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but why are people so neurotic and anxious and what can we do about it? Oh, well, the first thing I did touch on it. I think it's because of language. Yeah. I think it's as simple as that. It's, uh, um, and uh, not only do our imaginations go wild, but our the the company we keep goes wild. I mean, you you know, people we have to deal with people, and people are the worst because they got language. <laughs> I mean, they're just yeah. They're, yeah. so so. You know, you can be with someone and suddenly they go off. Uh, you don't have no idea what's going on with them. They're imagining some problem or something like that, or that you're the one doing that, and you got to figure all of that out. So. Don't panic. It's organic. We, this comes with the territory of being human. I mean, panic, it's organic. <laughs> panic, panic is organic. That is, it's, we're, we're going to be like this. It's, it's not easy to be human. Um, uh, it's way harder than being green. Um, I'm quoting Kermit the Frog. There. <laughs> <laughs> you I, get got, that. I got it. Oh. He was, he was on my PhD committee. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, and while I'm on small green things, um, uh, nice sentiment, but Yoda's wrong. There's only try. <laughs> yeah, and this idea there is no try. Yeah, yeah, nice motivation. No, there's only try. I tried um, that's that. all. Heard the, I said that to her the other day. I said, yeah. no, there is no try, there is only do. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, yes, so, right, yes. 
in in the past looking backwards that is true that is you can always look and say it either did or didn't happen yeah um and you might be accurate or inaccurate but to some extent or another you can you can measure that going forward that's not the case there's only try um and uh so here's what i've done about it and i swear this is an unsung uh thing that worked better than all the rest and i tried a whole lot of different things i am a fallibilist fallibilism is a technical term from philosophy and all it means is no matter how confident i am in a bet i'm still i remain still more confident that it is a bet so i can i can i I make some pretty heavy bets but i know their bets and i never forget their bets and that could make me anxious, but actually it relaxes me. It enables me to say, yeah, I could end up making a bet that kills me. I could even make a bet that ends up killing everybody. I'm trying to avoid those bets. I'm not saying, hey, everything's a bet, so it doesn't matter what you do. I call that the doctrine of foregone inconclusion. Hey, nobody knows anything, so I can believe whatever I want. No, it's not that at all. We're trying to make better bets, uh, but they're bets. You never reach 100% certainty on things. Um, and that which doesn't kill you, you could learn from. It doesn't make you, maybe it makes you stronger, maybe it doesn't make you stronger, whatever, but you can say, I'll adjust. Yeah. And as a result, you're not, you're not holding yourself to a standard that I think comes pretty universally to us, that there's some kind of, that this is a crossword, this is a, this is an exam, and at the end, you'll get your score, and if you don't get a, a passing score or a glowing score, you're going to end up in some kind of torture chamber situation. <laughs> um, I mean, you don't have to be religious to have this. I think this would yeah. just be something in us from parenting or who knows where. But um, uh, so this is relief for me, fallibilism. And the other piece of it we were going to touch on, and I'll touch on it briefly here, is irony. Irony, I think of as tipping your hand and showing that you're human. So irony is the stuff that's, that floods sitcoms, for example, mm -hmm. where you get people talking out both sides of their mouth, um, where they're saying the kind thing, but under their breath, they're also saying for the audience to hear the more competitive thing. They're saying the cooperative egoless thing, and they're also saying the ego thing. It's a way of showing I'm human. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with these same dilemmas that everybody else is dealing with. Now, what's an ironic situation? An ironic situation is where you set out to get a good result and it comes out bad. Or you do something bad and ironically it comes out good. So I thought I'd made the worst decision of my life and it's the best decision of my life. Ironically, it's, it turned out to be the best. So how fundamental is that potential in the universe? I would say the potential for you to miss... There's no one trying to read the situation before life. But if you look at physics, there are situations that reverse. Winds shift. Wind can be moving this way, and then it moves that way. We as organisms are trying to time those moves. So if you think of it as a game of red light, green light, which has gotten popular because of squid games, there is this question about timing. So if you were sailing, you want to time the winds and you want to change your sails in time for a shift in the winds. Yeah. And if you get it wrong, you could drown. Mm -hmm. So it's very serious. And it's also slapstick. So life is both incredibly serious. You could die. And it's really slapstick because there are these reversals that we're, we as organisms are fumblingly trying to track. So, so if you, if, if you look at it that way, and then you add the human element of it, that we've got language by which we're trying to track this stuff, and we end up with uh, ideas that are too simple or too complicated. You know, Einstein described uh, it, what we're after is as simple as possible, no simpler. Uh, so we're going to be overcomplicated. People always tell me I think too much, and I respond by telling them, that by my standards, they think too little. Or uh, no, I, I say, I think too much just right. Is what I say. <laughs> um, uh, but, but if you add that complication, we're just a hoot. It's just a hoot. Here we are, this mid-sized mammal <clears throat> that recently acquired this newfangled thing, language, and on top of that, technology. And it, it, from a certain perspective, 
the perspective I find the most comforting, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I wouldn't put it past me. I'm a fumbling guy trying to figure it out. There's a chance that I will have spent my entire life barking up the wrong tree. There's, for me, extraordinary peace in this. But then I have to also caveat that by saying, I have a ridiculously lucky life. Dumb luck. I didn't cause it. I just ended up with a life where I don't have many crises to deal with. My kids are older. Um, I have detangled myself from all obligations other than this work. That is, I'm, I'm 65. I say that I'm glad that my lack of appetite finally caught up with my lack of aptitude. I'm not great for relationship. But you can imagine. Can you imagine living with me? I mean, I mean, I have to, and I actually, I actually enjoy it. But if I were someone else, no, it's too, I'm I'm not good at I'm not good for that. But boy, did I have a good run, and it was intense. Um, and uh, and no, I'm so I'm retired. I'm happily, really happily married to solitude. You know, the selectively populated solitude. I got great friendships. I, but. So if you think of it this way, and I got money, and how did I end up with money? I inherited it. It, it bugged the heck out of me for 40 years that I inherited it. At one point, I sounded a vow of poverty and gave away all I had. But that's why I get to spend my whole day thinking about this stuff. And it's also, you could say, it makes me ivory tower and out of touch. It does. It's true. And it also makes it so I can look at it a little bit more neutrally. So there are trade-offs. I could be out, completely out of touch with what people's reality is like. And at the same time, since I don't have uh, skin riding on it, you know, a braised bruised skin, it's a different situation uh, for me. I get to, there's a chance that I will employ the power of neutral thinking a little bit better. That is, I, I don't have to, my biases are not e eating at me quite as much as they would be if I had it to, for example, maintain status in order to keep food on the table. It's a radically different situation. So I can only tell you what I guess would be a source of equanimity. And I don't think it would help if your kid is, has got cancer or if you're, you can't pay your next month's rent. Um, I don't know how much pleasure you could get out of thinking humanity is the hoot and uh, uh, <laughs> irony is the answer. And uh, we're only just guessing. But I do think that those are the real situation for us. And in that respect, I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's why I sell it. I think it's the actual adaptive, realistic way to think about us is that we are these mid-sized mammals who only recently got language. You know, if humans go extinct anytime in the next 10,000 years, uh, if you scrunched all of the universe's history into one year, the human experiment would have lasted four seconds. Yeah. Wow. This, Language is a really radical adaptation. Deeply visionary, deeply delusional. We can fall off the wagon. So th we're just in the middle of a really radical experiment in evolution. Not that anybody is trying out experiments, but you think about it. There's just not, on this planet, there's no other intelligent life by that standard. No other organism that can imagine rhinos with tutus. Um, we're the only ones or, or galaxies, you know, it's just, it's, it's wild to be one of us. So where do you think the, uh, the future of our communication is going? Is uh, that's a great question. Um, so I work with a few people who think that we're, what we're building is a global brain and we're coming together and, uh, that it will mean that we will work for our, the whole planet's survival. I, I disagree with them. Um, I think it's way more complicated than that. Oh, yeah. I think there's a kind of virtual brain, but I don't think that the, I don't think that societies are real living selves. They're made up of selves that come and go, but that's a long, longer, complicated question. We are seeing where it is going right now. So let me, let me provide a cheerful approach to this. Let you don't have to this. sugarcoat it for <laughs> us. I won't, but it's actually a real possibility. So and I can tell you, I can tell you, I'll do, I'll do the quick and obvious thing. Um, dissociation death spiral. That's where it's going. We will communicate, we'll become increasingly outraged and purist and, and feeling pious through our outrage and we'll rail at each other and we'll blow the whole damn thing up. 
and we that will be the end of the experiment and will have lasted three seconds in the universe's history, <laughs> year long history. Okay, here's the other version of it. Um, we're a hair's breadth from the native wit it would take to make this thing work, to make make human life work. Our technology, these are these are the glory days for humankind, and not just our technology, but also us coming to terms with who we are. Yeah, we're shedding old traditions about who we are, that is, they are losing their power to hold us. Whether they like it or not, we are definitely seeing a backlash from them, the outrage at the culture that is moving towards ironic fallibilism. You watch what happens in pop culture, that's what there is there. You watch Marvel movies, Marvel movies are filled with ironic banter where people are expressing ambivalences about the ambiguities in reality. And at the same time, we have gotten in recent years some really great examples of total a-hole behavior. I mean, just like, like you could mistake Stalin for a communist. He wasn't. He was a, he's a a-hole. I mean, he was an a-hole dressed up in Stalin... In, in communism, you could mistake Hitler for a nationalist or a national socialist or an anti-Semite. I would, you know, these things matter to me. Uh, you could mistake Trump for a, a racist. I don't, I mean, I think he's racist, but I also don't think that that's pri primarily what drives him. Um, and you can cut this part, but I'm saying that is what we're seeing increasingly is that you can be an a-hole for any, dressed up in anything. Yeah. And that a-holes are the problem and that the antidote to it is to stay human and be human and recognize that we are all ambivalent about reality's ambiguities. So we're trying to decide what to do. We're dealing with all these forks in the road where you could go, you're trying to figure out which is the right way to go. And that we're actually... Um, we're learning, we're gaining the antibodies necessary, the cultural antibodies necessary to, of, to constrain a holery the way we've learned to constrain criminality, crimins, criminality to some extent. I mean, that's ongoing work, but to constrain that, uh, the way we're beginning to deal with appropriately with ways uh, to deal with mental illness, um, all of this stuff is new. Psychology as a field is a hundred years old oh. and it ain't rocket science. It's way harder than rocket science. Yeah. Sure. No, it's the ultimate cluster flux. What's going on with between us. It's just, so, so we are on the steepest part of humanity's learning curve. So I'm a romantic cynic. That is, I believe that the fates are destined to make things turn out well for us. And I totally don't believe that at the same time. I think we're doomed. Um, and I hold those two together. And what that means is that I'm, um, I have friends who work to try to make the world better and they, their spirits go up and down depending on how we're doing. Um, I mean, the, their motivation to do the work goes up and down and I get that. But I, you can say perhaps because of my safe situation, I'm just going to work on this until until I die or until I can't work on it anymore. Um, uh, till my idea of a, a productive day is that I had a good bowel movement. I mean, whatever, there's going to come a time. But my point is, um, however we're doing, I'm monitoring that, but it doesn't make a difference to my attempts to bring about a better world. Um, and to keep on learning what that would mean and where I'm screwing up and all that. That, that's, that seems to be the object of the game. I'm just doing that until the end. So I, I'm post-angst, post-outrage about this stuff. I'm assuming that a-holery is something that would be tempting to all of us, me, including, me included. So this is just my work. You know, I'm, I'm just at it that way. But how are, you know, how are we doing? You know, if I was a betting man and I was going to make big money if I got it right, I'd say we're doomed. Um, if I'm if I'm the human I am, not nah, that's, that's irrelevant. I, I think we got great potential. I, I'm just trying to figure out how to squeeze it out with what I what little power I have. Yeah, Let's see, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head. I think uh, realistically, there are a lot of scenarios that are doom and gloom, and you know all the equations lead to that.
Uh. All of all of uh, everything visual and everything you know written down is leading to that. But it, as a human being, I think we just hope for the best. And I think the majority of us aren't a holes, and we try as hard as we can to treat with people respect and give them their time and their opinion and get their way yeah. get their ways out and possibly yeah. they can. But you know, I hate to say it, but we're gonna have to cut short. No, it's not short. You today, guys, <laughs> but you know, an hour and a half with you is, is a good amount of time. And yeah, I can, yeah. I can and if you need a nap. Half. Yeah. If you need another nap after this, if you need a nap after this, I totally understand that. No. That's oh, normal whole... after talking to you. <laughs> Even for me, I take naps. <laughs> I, I like a good nap. <laughs> so do I. But no, I, I hope that our, our readers actually listen and follow follow yeah. along instead of kind of touch in and out because they've, they're, you've made a lot of good points. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's from a very deep perspective. And that's what I was hoping for when I got in contact with you. Yeah. Good. So we really appreciate you coming on with us today. And it was a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it, it yeah. worked that way. And it's a pleasure to be with you both. We just sitting on the, the front porch of the universe. Yeah. yeah. Speculating <laughs> about it and us in it. Yeah. That's what I mean. If we really had vodka in the, in the fish bowl, you're that's right. No. Gonna, yeah. I don't know. I'd be sitting all night long. Yeah. Here, <laughs> let, me, let me, let me pour you a glass. <laughs> No, doctor, we're going to leave you with that. And like I said, we really appreciate you coming on with us. And yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. That was appreciate enlightening. It. All right. So we want to thank everyone who's listening and watching for uh, your time this time and until next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.